Last week, towards the end of the week, we started looking at the idea of conservation of momentum. Like any other conservation law, it says that something cannot be created or destroyed. In this case, we would say that momentum wouldn't be created or destroyed. In other words, momentum always remains the same. The momentum that you start with is always going to be the same as the momentum that we end with. That is, if we have an isolated system. What does an isolated system mean? That's the condition that must be met in order for the total momentum to stay the same. So it's kind of important that we know what an isolated system is. Who can tell me what it means? Yep. Good. There's no energy or mass coming in or out of the system. Now, mass is important, right? We can't have any mass coming into the system. If, you know, if we're, if we're looking at a collision and a guy jumps out of the car, well, then kind of all bets are off, right, if we're not taking into account the mass of the guy. But that doesn't usually happen. Mass isn't usually our concern. It's usually energy that's our concern. We've got to make sure that there's no energy in or out of the system. In order to make sure there's no energy in or out of the system, we basically have to make sure that there's no external forces acting. If we have no external forces acting, we're good to go with the law of conservation of momentum. Now, the law of conservation of momentum we said on Friday can be used whenever we have a collision, which is two things coming together, or three or four things coming together for that matter, or when we have an explosion. And by an explosion, we could mean literally something blowing up, but we could mean something as simple as you standing on a piece of ice throwing a ball. The one object, that is the ball and you combined, becomes two objects. One thing splits apart into two. It could be something like uh, the video that I showed you last week when we fire the gun. When we fire the gun, the bullet goes one way, the gun goes the other way. One object basically became two. When we do the law of conservation of momentum to solve a problem, we always set it up like this. PI is equal to PF. The initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. Now, there will be one or two or three or four terms on each side of that equation. M1 V1I plus M2 V2I. That would represent two objects before the collision took place. If we had 15 objects before the collision took place, 15 objects colliding together, then we would have 13 more MV terms. We would have a momentum for each object that we have before the collision takes place. We will also have a momentum for each object that we have after the collision takes place. If we have two objects afterwards, then it's going to look like this, two objects, two terms. If we have one object because the two objects have stuck together, then we're just going to replace that with MVF. If we have 14 objects, then we're going to go all the way up to M14, V14F. Yeah, that's not very common, by the way, to do something like that. Does that make some sense? We did an example problem on Friday that uh, allowed us to, to use this. We had uh, a couple of objects colliding, and then they stuck together, so it became one object after the collision. We set that up as M1V1I plus M2V2I equals MVF, because it was only one object after the collision. We also had some practice problems that we had for homework over the weekend that were similar to that. Page 477. Any issues with either of these questions on 477? Yep, absolutely. The second one? We need the first one going over as well, or are we good with just the second one? All right, let's take a look at the second one then. It says, a 1,050 kilogram car at an intersection has a velocity of 2.65 to the north. Uh, and that's meters per second, so we don't need to worry about red circles. Right? The car hits a stationary truck. The bumper's locked together. The velocity of the car truck system immediately after the collision is uh, 0 0.78 meters per second to the north. What's the mass of the truck? Um, I am going to uh, circle this whole lock together thing because that tells me that if they're locking together, then the two objects that we have before the collision takes place become one object afterwards, right? They stick together. It's only one object, the car and the truck, after the collision combined. Let's, let's say car object number one will be the car, and let's say object number two will be the truck. <coughs> It makes it a little bit easier to identify objects as number one and number two in terms of writing down givens. Right now we know that M1 will be the mass of the car and V1i will be the initial velocity of the car 
and so on and so on. What's this 1,050 kilograms? It's a mass, obviously, right? But is it M1 or is it M2? We defined the car as object number one, so I'm going to call this M, M1. Good. Uh, a velocity of 2.65 meters per second to the north. That is a velocity, obviously. Is it V1 or is it V2? It's V1. Good. Is it V1i or is it V1f? Before the collision takes place, or is it after the collision takes place? It's VI, V1I, the initial velocity of the car before the collision takes place. The car hits the rear of a stationary truck. Um, what does that tell us, the whole stationary truck thing? Something is zero meters per second. Is it V1 or is it V2? It's V2. The velocity of the truck. Is it V2i or is it V2f? Good. The initial velocity of the truck, the velocity of the truck before the collision takes place, is zero meters per second. Okay, they lock together. We want to find the, we have the velocity of the car truck system afterwards is 0 0.78. Let's call that V what? V1 or V2? V12, okay. Call it V12. That's the velocity of both of them combined. Or we could just drop the subscript because they're both combined and call it V. Doesn't really matter. VI or VF? Or V12I or V12F? Initial or final? Good. Somebody gets this stuff. It's the final velocity of both of these objects combined after the collision has taken place. We want to know the mass of the truck, so we're looking for M2. We're looking for M2. It's a collision, so we can set this up using the law of conservation of momentum. That doesn't mean there's no impulse involved in this question. There is. Each of these objects, the car and the truck, both experience a change in momentum. They both experience an impulse, but the overall impulse is zero. The, the total momentum before the collision is the same as the total momentum after the collision. We said that last week, right? We can experience a change in momentum for individual objects within the system, but the total momentum will stay the same if we have an isolated system. All right, let's say PI is equal to PF. We had two objects before the collision takes place, so we're going to say M1V1I plus M2V2I. Two objects, two terms. How many objects did we have after the collision has taken place? One. Good, Jordan. Thank you. So we're going to have one term, MVF, after the collision has taken place. M1, we know what it is. It's 1,050. V1I is 2.65. M2, we don't know what it is. What's V2I? Zero. What's something times zero? Whatever the value of M2 is. Don't know what it is, but what, whatever it is, what is its value times zero equal to? It's equal to zero, right? Anything times zero is equal to zero. So we can cross off that term if we wish. Uh, we don't know what M is. That's the combined mass, right, of the car and the truck. VF is going to be 0 0.78 meters per second. What do we get when we do the math on this one to get M? It's not 2.5 2 times 10 to the 3, by the way. It's not that value. What do we end up getting when we solve for M there? 3,567 kilograms. Thank you. Now, what does that mass represent? What have we just calculated? It's the combined mass. If we want the mass of the truck, what are we going to do with this combined mass to get the mass of the truck? We're, we're going to subtract it, right? So we're going to say 3,567 kilograms minus the mass of the car, 1,050 kilograms, and that should give us I think, rounded to two digits, 2.5 times 10 to the 3 kilograms. Does that make sense? A little bit of a tricky question, right, because of that little thing that we had to do at the end with the subtraction. The fact that we weren't solving directly for the mass of the truck in that equation. But in the end, it's still mathematically not that tough of a question. It's just a matter of recognizing what to do at the end of the question. All right, let's take a look at another example here, okay? We've got a basketball player in a wheelchair 
having a combined mass of 58 kilograms. She moves at point six to the east and pushes off a stationary player, player B, while jockeying for position near the basket. Player A ends up moving at point two zero meters per second to the west. Here's, here's something that I, just, that I just spotted. I've got something to the east and something to the west. That means that one of them is going to have to be a negative value, right? I don't want to forget that, so I'm drawing attention to that by circling it in red or highlighting it or underlining it or something so that it sticks out when I go to actually solve my problem. The combined mass of player B in our wheelchair is 85 kilograms. What's going to be players, what is going to be players B velocity immediately after this, this interaction has taken place? This collision between these two people has taken place. All right. Um, the fact that we have a combined mass of a player in a wheelchair doesn't real, we don't have to really do anything with the whole combination of wheelchair person here, right? The person in the wheelchair stay together. The person's not falling off the wheelchair. So we're going to say the mass of person, we're going to call uh, the mass of person A 58 kilograms. Really, that's the mass of person A and her wheelchair, but since they're staying together, it doesn't really matter. We don't need to define these ones as one and object one and two, right? Because we've already got them defined as object A and object B. What's this 0 0.6 meters per second thing? It's a velocity, right? V1 or is it V2? V1 or V2? Jack, V1 or V2? Uh, sorry, VA or VB, I should say. Good, it would be VA. Would it be VAI, VA initial, or VA final? What is it? It's going to be VA initial. I'm not a big fan of using the letters to distinguish the objects, A and B. I like using the numbers, object one and two, because, I don't know, to me, when we start adding a whole bunch of subscripts, it gets confusing as it is. When we start adding all the subscripts as letters, to me, it gets even more confusing. So. Uh, the only reason that I've called it A and B here is because that's what they call them in the question. If you prefer to rename them object one and two, then that's just fine. Okay, I often do that, to be honest, just because I don't like the A's and the B's. Yep. Oh, look at that. We do have all the givens written down. That's okay. Let's, let's scratch them out so that we have to do it ourselves. You're right, but we want to be able to do it ourselves, obviously. Okay? Uh, what else we got here? Pushes off a stationary player, player B. What do we know about that, stationary player, player B? That's a velocity, right? Some zero meters per second. Some object is not moving. So it's got a velocity of zero meters per second. Is that, uh, that going to be VA or VB? It's going to be VB. Good. Is it going to be VB initial or VB final, Matt? VB, it's the uh, velocity of object B, person B. Is it going to be initial or final, before the collision or after? Good. VB initial. After this collision takes place, player A ends up moving at 0 0.20 meters per second to the west. That's going to be VA, the velocity of player A. Is it going to be VA initial or is it going to be VA final? Courtney, initial or final? Final, good. VA final is... I'm going to write that down, actually, negative 0.20 meters per second. They have already got the number written down there in the question, but I'm going, to, I'm going to put it down there separately just because I want to remember specifically that it's a negative value. The combined mass of player B in our wheelchair is 85 kilograms. We're going to call that MB. We want to find VB, the velocity of player B, initial or final, Joel. So we've got a whole lot of stuff that's written down here. And it looks a little bit confusing because you've got stuff written everywhere. But in the end, since we have everything written down, it's just a matter of plugging numbers into an equation at this point. We're going to say PI is equal to PF. There are two objects before the collision has taken place. So we're going to have two terms, M1V1I plus M2V2I. After the collision has taken place, there are still two objects because they haven't stuck together. Uh, sorry, it's not M1V1I. What is it? 
keep going with those numbers. What is it? It's M A V A I, right? Plus M B V B I. On the other side, we still have two objects, so we're still going to have two terms. It's going to be M A V A F plus M B V B F. Two objects before they've stuck uh, before they've struck each other. Two objects after they've struck each other. Now let's plug our numbers in. This is the easy part because we've got everything circled and identified already. M A is going to have a value of uh, 58 kilograms. VA initial is 0 0.60 meters per second. VB is stationary. VB is zero. So M times VB, M times zero, is just zero. MA is 58 again. VA final is negative 0.20. If you leave off that negative, you will get the wrong answer. That's why I circled it in red and then wrote it down separately there. MB, object B has a mass of 85 kilograms. And we're looking for object B's final velocity. Let's multiply 58 times 0.6. What do we get for that? 58 times 0.6. 34.8 plus 58 times negative 0.2. That's going to give us 11.6, uh, negative 11.6 plus 85 times VF. Let's take the 11.6 over to the other side by adding now. We're going to end up with 45.4. And then we're going to take the 85 over to the other side by what? By dividing. Good. So 45.4 divided by 85 is going to give me somewhere in the range of uh, 0 0.55, 0 0.6. What is it? 0.545. We're going to round them to two digits. 0 0.55 meters per second. It worked out to be a positive value. What does that tell us about the direction of this? of this final, final velocity of player B. Yeah, she's going to the east, right? That makes sense? Is that harder than the questions that we did on Friday? Questions we had for homework over the weekend? Not really, I don't think. What's the difference? On Friday, our players, or our, our objects stuck together. Now our objects aren't sticking together. Before, we had two terms before the collision and one term after. Now we've got two terms before the collision and two terms after. So mathematically, there's a tiny little bit more to it because there's an extra term in there. But conceptually, I don't think it's any more difficult at all. If we could do those questions last week, I think we could do these questions now. We'll see. Give you a chance to work on these two questions on 478 for the next, I'll say, eight, ten, eight, eight minutes or so. We'll see how it goes. All right, everyone, if we're having no trouble with those two questions, let's try another example here. We've got another collision here. Example uh, 9.8, page 479. It says 110 kilogram Stampeders football fullback moving east at 1.80 meters per second on a snowy playing field is struck by a 140 kilogram Eskimos defensive lineman moving west at 1.5. Right away, I see, I see an east and I see a west. So I want to circle that because I know that that's going to mean one of them has got to be negative. It doesn't really matter which one we make negative, but they've got to be opposite signs. Draw attention to that. Uh, the fullback has bounced west at uh, 0.25 meters per second. What's the velocity of the Eskimos defensive lineman going to be just after the impact? Let's call the Stampeders football player object number one, and let's call the Eskimos football player uh, player number two. That means if the St. Peter's player is player number one, that means the 110 kilograms is going to be mass one, the mass of the, f the first, first football player, the mass of the St. Peter's player. He's moving east at 1.80 meters per second. That's going to be V1 
the velocity of the stampeders player, is that going to be V1i? Or is that going to be V1f? Brenda, V1i, initial or final? Good. It's going to be V1i. He's struck by 140 kilograms Eskimos defensive lineman. We're going to call him M2. And he's moving west at 1.5 meters per second. So we're going to call that, that V2, the velocity of, of uh, the Eskimos player, player 2, V2i. Or is that going to be V2f, Kaylee? Initial or final? I'm sorry? For me? For the uh, 1.5 meters per second. Right, V2i, V2 initial. The fullback is bounced west at 0 0.250 meters per second. That's going to be V something F, right? V something F, negative 0 0.250 meters per second. Final velocity. Is it going to be V1 or is it going to be V2? Jade V1 or V2? For this one right here, 0.25 meters per second. It's going to be V1 because the, football, the fullback is the Stampeders player, right? So it's going to be V1 final. Good. And don't forget that negative, negative 0 0.250 meters per second. What's the velocity of the Eskimos defensive lineman going to be just after impact? We're looking for V2F, the velocity of the Eskimos player after the collision has taken place. So we're going to do our whole PI equals PF thing. How many objects do we have before this collision has taken place? What do we got here? Uh, Colin, how many objects do we have before this collision has taken place? How many football players do we have? We have two objects before the collision takes place, so we're going to have two terms, M1, V1, initial, plus M2, V2, initial. How many objects do we have after this collision has taken place? Do you know? Two. M1, V1, F, plus M2, V2, F, two objects, two terms. Let's plug some numbers in now. Now it becomes pretty easy. Uh, M1 is going to be 110 kilograms. V1i is 1.80 meters per second. And it's to the east, so we're going to make it positive. M2 is 140 kilograms. V2i says is uh, west at 1.5. We're going to make that negative 1.50 meters per second. M1 is, again, 110 kilograms. V1f is negative 0 0.250. M2 is 140 again, times V2F, which is what we're looking for here. So what's different about this question than the last question that we did and the questions that we're working on on Friday? On Friday, we had two objects before, one object after. The last questions, the last set of questions we just did, we had two objects before and two objects after, but one of them was at rest before the collision took place. Now we've got two objects before and two objects after, but both of them are moving at both times, both before and after. It doesn't make it any harder. It just makes it a little bit more mathematically intensive, right? An extra term in there, so there's an extra calculation to do. Let's do the math on this here now. We're going to do this first by saying 110 times 1.8. We get a number there on the left side of 198. We're going to add to that on the left-hand side 140 times negative 1.5. We get a number for the left-hand side of 12. On the right-hand side, what do we get? Well, we're going to say 110 times negative 0.25. That equals negative 27.5. plus 140 times V2F. What do we got to get rid of next, the 27.5 or the 140? Uh, sorry, is that negative 12? Is it? Thank you. What do we get rid of next, 27.5 or 140? 27.5. Let's take it over to the other side by adding. Uh, when we do that, it becomes 
uh, positive 15.5 equals 140 times V2F. Now, we've got to get rid of the 140 by taking it over by dividing. What's 15.5 divided by 140? We end up getting uh, 0 0.11. Is that the right number of digits? Uh, should have three digits, right? So it should be 0 0.111 meters per second. Harder? Now again, maybe rearranging the equation to solve for your answer is a tiny bit harder because you've got an extra term in there and, and stuff. But in the end, conceptually, this is no harder than the questions that we did on Friday, the questions we did earlier today in class. Give you a chance to copy that down if you don't already have it. And then once you've got that, then we'll move on to doing a couple practice problems on this. All right, everyone's got their copy down now. Let's take a look at those two problems that go along with that on page 479. If nobody has any trouble with these questions, we're working on multiple choice questions here right now. Multiple choice 10, 13, and 14. 13. They get progressively more difficult. 13 is a little bit more tricky than number 10. 10, I think, should go fairly straightforward. Should be fairly straightforward. Should go pr fairly well for us. 13 is a little bit trickier. I want to go over that one in just a minute. Okay, and then 14, if we have time, I'd like to go over today as well. Take a look at number 13 here, whether we're finished or not here. It says, an empty freight car of mass M coasts along a track at 2 meters per second until it couples to a stationary freight car of mass 2M the final speed of the two freight cars immediately after the collision is what? So we've got this collision taking place between these two cars, but we don't know what the mass of either one of them is. However, we do know the relative mass. We know that one of them is twice the mass of the other one. We can use that. Let's set it up the way we normally set it up. PI is equal to PF because it is a collision. And we're going to say M1V1I plus M2V2I equals, do they stick together? Uh, it does. It says it couples to a stationary freight car, so we're going to call it M times VF. Notice how in this equation that I've set up here, I've got three different symbols for mass. We've always said that, ma that momentum is, is mass times velocity. And remember when we did variable value changing, we said that momentum was mass times velocity, but the symbol that we usually give to mass is M, but really it can be 2M or half M or you know, velocity can be V or 3V or a third V or just whatever, right? In the end here, we've given three different symbols for mass, and we're going to give three different symbols still in just a moment here. If we said the first mass was M1, what are we going to say the first mass is now after we start subbing things in? Can't sub in a number because we don't know its value. What can we replace M1 with? Just M. Tells me the mass of the empty freight car is m. Its velocity is 2.00 meters per second. What are we going to replace m2 with? 2m. Right. We're going to say that the mass of the second car is twice the mass of the first car, and it's oh, it's stationary, so we can actually we can actually just cross that off, right? Since uh, v2i is zero, what's going to be m over here? It's not m anymore. It's the combined mass, right? Well, what's the combined mass of m and 2m? m plus 2m. Well, it's 1 plus 2. So it's going to be 3m then, right? Well, what are we going to do here? We've got two unknowns. We've got m in two places, and then we've got vf as well. What are we going to do here to solve for vf? Yeah, or we can just cancel out the m. In effect, that's what you said, right? In effect, we're just canceling at the mass because it appears in both terms. Let's divide both sides by m. When we divide the left side by m, we get 2. The right side by m, we get 3v. So it becomes 2.00 equals 3 times vf. I take the 3 over by dividing, and vf ends up being equal to 6, 0 0.667 meters per second. Is that good? Do you see how now we get a diploma exam question or a unit test question that is really just stuff that we've already done, but there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a twist to it. Right? That happens to us, right? We've got to be prepared for a little twist like that. Okay? This is a mathematical twist as opposed to a conceptual twist. Mathematically, we can cancel out that M. You'd be prepared for things like that. 
And the last multiple choice question that I asked you to work on was question number 14. I suspect there's still people working on that. Is that right? Still people working on 14? Okay, keep working on that. And uh, we probably won't have an opportunity to go over that today. We'll probably look at that tomorrow. All right, so let's take a look at multiple choice number 14. Let's make sure the following work is done for tomorrow, okay? Uh, practice problems on 478 if you didn't finish them. 479 if you didn't finish them. And then let's make sure these three multiple choice questions, 10, 13, and 14, are done for tomorrow if you didn't finish them. Got it? All right, that's it for today.